the channel is intended for mature audiences. <laughs> okay, we're going live, guys. <laughs> Alright, here we go. Hi, everyone. It's Dom here from Esports News UK. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, as you can see from the stream, uh, Ollie was unsuccessful in getting his webcam set up on time, so we're half an hour late, but we're all here. <laughs> we're all together. Uh, we do have a picture of Ollie, at least. So, uh, yeah, today we're doing something a bit different. I wanted to, we've been wanting to do this for a while. We keep bumping into each other at events and, and, and the press areas and things like that and wanted to just chat about journalism in esports and what it's like being an esports journalist, I guess, in the UK. Um, so, yeah, with, there's four of us here. Uh, if you guys want to introduce yourselves, starting with Mike, Michael and then Ollie. Wait, is, am I Mike and he's Michael? Does that work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right okay um so i don't even know who's called michael to be fair right uh i am mike stubbs at mike stubbs on twitter get that in nice and early um basically i am a freelance esports journalist um i don't like kind of these guys i don't really focus on the uk that much i do more international big stuff like that um but yeah i write for a load of places like i do a lot for red bull uh been on Eurogamer, been on telegraph do stuff on forbes so if there's money to be paid for writing about esports, I'll probably be there. <laughs> nice. I um yeah, I'm Michael Moriarty. I'm also a freelance esports journalist type. Uh, I do a lot of UK esports stuff as well as general esports business stuff with esports insider. Um, I also write for UK Cisco and outside and outside of just doing journalism stuff, I work for Reason Gaming as a manager for their team in the G for the Elite series. Oh, cool. Ollie? Um, oh, I've got the camera working on the laptop now, Dom. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> You're too late. You're too the late. The drivers are working, Dom. No, we're not, we're, 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 we're live. Place. We're in the middle of going live. It's, it's right, done gonna, now. I'm Ollie. I don't have a webcam. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my full-time job is working for Esports Insider, which is business to business esports news. Um, it's every bit as glamorous as it sounds. I still mainly do Dota writing for Red Bull. I've had words on Green Man Gaming, Cyber Sport, everyone's favourite publications. Um, yeah, pretty much done a load of esports rubbish, which is, is great fun. Okay, cool. And a bit about me. I know I head up Esports News UK. My background uh, was in trade journalism. Uh, so a, a little bit different to some of these guys. I wrote for MCV, PCR... Uh, games and sort of PC trade magazines and I've done a little bit of freelance work over the years a, little, a bit for Riot Games, a bit for Red Bull and, and a few others uh, but it's mainly Esports News UK I write for and then I do the content for the British Esports Association as well the not-for-profit uh, set up to support Esports in Britain so we've all got a really sort of varied background I guess to start off with guys could we maybe talk about how we got into journalism because I know we wanted to talk about uh, you know offer advice to people about getting into journalism so how did you guys sort of get into writing about esports and, and journalism who wants yeah, to go you first take, go on you take it away go on take it away, duck. all right yeah well mine mine's completely ridiculous um, i did economics at university graduated with two one my attitude when i left university was i don't really care what i do as long as i make a load of money when it worked in finance, turns out my attitude changed very quickly. I had a miserable two and a half years at KPMG doing tax accountancy, which is uh, all fun and games. And then I moved to Glaxo Smith Klein, worked there for six months, um, decided enough was enough. When I left my job at Glaxo Smith Klein, I had just picked up uh, my first bit of freelance work with Red Bull, um, kind of just looking around for random jobs and something that I wanted to enjoy. Mm. Um, and kind of esports was always a, a passion area. I've been watching Dota for too many years, seven years, 9,000, 10,000 hours in that stupid game. Uh, so I picked that up. When I when I left, like genuinely, when I left my finance job, I was earning more in a day of work at finance than I was in a month of freelance work. So then I kind of had to broaden my horizons, decide that I couldn't live off that money forever and, and start growing it. So yeah, that was kind of my first entrance. Um, I used to write professional tax reports, which are very, very different to esports articles. <laughs> Sure, and the and the two Michaels, Mike and Michael. Go, Dirk. I'll let you go. Yes, yeah, so I started writing uh, in esports uh, <laughs> with uh, Reason Gaming, who I'm also now back with. So I'm sort of gone full circle, depressingly. Um, 
I started writing a bit for a bit about that CSGO team. Uh, <laughs> and now, and uh, then I moved on to a site owned by the same guy as Reason Gaming, which is UK CSGO, where I started doing more journalism related stuff. Mm. Um, I've been doing that for about two and a half years now. I've done a few freelance things for ESO, done stuff for Unicorn, done stuff for some uh, variously, <laughs> various other names. Uh, and yeah, um, I currently work for Esports Insider as well at the moment. So also just the general freelance grind. Cool. Adam, I'm also got a shout out, say Adam Heath gave me everything in Esports because he's about to punch me in the face. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so that was me, uh, and I kind of, well, the earliest thing is like when I was 16, I lied in my Twitter bio and said that I was a freelance games journalist and I'd never published anything before, and uh, someone followed me and was like, oh, I've just started a blog up, do you want to come write for it? I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Um, so I basically lied and got me in the door. Um, I got into this like little tiny blog that was just three of us, and I know I'd ever read it, but uh, this was what, this was quite a few years ago i'd been in college it was whatever if you remember peter molyneux's curiosity cube it was yeah. when that came out so i used to do a da- i used to do a daily blog about that um which was a terrible idea <laughs> but basically i did that and then kind of for a year bounced around tiny little sites that were like oh for every thousand views you get you'll get a dollar but like no article would get more than 100 views so you'd never make any money um and then by chance i stumbled on a tweet that said a website called god is a geek was looking for writers I was like, yeah, I'm a writer. So I applied there, and this was all like normal games. This wasn't esports at all. This was traditional games journalism. Mm. Um, so I did that for quite a while. I was at God is a Geek. Just It was still volunteer work, but God is a Geek is quite a big publication in the UK. So mm. like, you get to go to events, preview events, stuff like that. Um, and then I kind of just stumbled on Dota one day, played it, quite liked it, um, and said to God is a Geek, like, I'll do esports for you. They were like, okay, whatever. That's a buzzword. Have fun. <laughs> um, so it was kind of left for our devices to do that for a bit. And then the people at God is a Geek introduced me to the people at Red Bull. Started getting actually paid for work then. Um, this was, what, a little two and a half years ago now? And then that year, I was meant to go to uni for a year. Got to uni, was like, did Freshers Week. Was like, nah, I can't be fucked with this. Um, dropped out of uni after a week. And then came back and went, guess I'm full-time freelance now because I need to make money. So just kind of started pitching people, wormed my way into places. Um, and then a guy called Chris Higgins, who you might know, he kind of left MCV's esports site and asked me if I wanted to take over. So I did that for a while, then launched Esports Pro, which is another trade website. And then just kind of decided actually freelance is quite good fun. So I went back to being freelance and now, quote, the UK's best esports journalist, VG247. There we go. Nice. To say that. Nice. Yeah, I was wondering how long it would take you to bring out that <laughs> stupid quote. I, I had to put up with him telling me that he was the UK's best esports journalist, which is a simply a lie, and b yeah, he just he just liked to say it every single week. Right. Every time you see him, he's got that smug look on his face. Tom, come on, Mike, let's let's get out your system. Tell us the story. Why did they call you the UK's best esports journalist? What what was that all about? Well, so when the BBC announced that they were going to show the Elite series. Um, obviously me and Ollie had been signed up to do some work on it and uh, so I tweeted out when the announcement was made like I'm really pleased to be a part of this in a small way I'll be like live blogging the action for two weeks in August Um, and then because back from my old like doing games journalism days and going to preview events and stuff kind of all the games journalists that do normal stuff like follow me on Twitter I know them Um, and so a guy from VG247, the editor, Matt Martin, wrote the story about the BBC. Yeah. And his final paragraph was like, oh, you don't need to worry about the BBC just being a cash grab or something like that. Uh, because they've got the UK's best esports journalist, Mike Stubbs, involved. And then he had my tweet embedded. I was like, all right, bang it. And then two weeks later, he was like, do you want to come do some freelance work for us? I was like, yes. Excellent. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah. I think the lesson from all this, guys, if you're watching this and you want to get into journalism, and I know there's a few people in there, Rectify on the on, in the Twitch chat. Hi, thanks for everyone uh, for joining in. I think the lesson from all this, if you want to do it, journalism, mini sports, just do it, you know, and it's the same. Casters will say the same thing, you know, they'll, ask them, they'll say, they'll give advice to a prospective caster saying, just cast, you know, um, just set up a blog. It's really easy to do on WordPress, Blogger, sites like that. Uh, 
share your articles, you know, write twit longers and, and find your niche as well. Is there a particular game you want to write about and that kind of thing? And I, I'd say just, just go for it, just do it. And one thing I will say as well, I get a lot of people emailing me wanting to write and I ask them what they read and it's just like a couple of sites. I think it's so good to read as much as possible as a journalist. I know this is going to sound weird, but like if you're in like a barber's or something like that, I'll often have all kinds of magazines in there. You know, I'll just flick through any magazine. I'll just read it, even if I'm not interested in it. You know, Heat magazine, whatever. I'll just read it. And the more you read, the more you take in. Like it, it helps with like, uh, I think you don't even realise it, but you subconsciously sort of get better at writing headlines and things. You know, do you guys find that? Do you read like a, a variety of uh, different publications other than just sort of esports sites? Do you think that's important to look beyond our specialism? Yes, because um, as esports is quite a niche industry or whatever, like most, a lot of people aren't uh, like ex- have don't have massive amounts of experience in writing. So mm. if you want to improve your uh, knowledge and wherever you go look at traditional media so like proper newspaper papers and sports magazines and all that vague stuff which are sort of things i sort of similarly do yeah okay cool um anyone else in this chat ch- ch- chime in Stop. yeah no i think I'm, I'm just gonna say on that like one of the things so i back when i was like teenage i was a terrible writer to the point where my english teacher thought that i was dyslexic um which she blurted out in the middle of class one day when I had no idea. So, like, my technical writing ability was absolutely shocking. I couldn't string a sentence together. Um, but I, what got me into, like, what improved my writing a lot is back in the old days on a publication called Eurogamer, which is traditional games, I used to read that a lot, and they had two writers, um, I like Christian Donlan and Simon Parkin. Mm. And Donlan and Parkin are just, they're not just good games writers, they're phenomenal writers. Like, Parkin has now gone on to the New Yorker, Mm. Um, and doesn't actually write about games that much anymore. They're just phenomenal writers, and that's kind. Of, those two guys are kind of the reason why I wanted to start writing about games in the first place. Mm. Um, and the way they structure their stories, and like even go back and read some of the old Donlan and Park and stuff. Like Donlan's L.A. Noir piece is probably the greatest piece of games journalism I've ever read. Mm. Um, and just reading their stuff, one hundred percent improved my writing because I would see what they would do and go, "All oh, right, they've done this," and then. Like eventually it becomes subconscious that you just steal what they That's do. That's right, yeah, um, yeah. Kind of but you add your own stuff. sort of style to it, don't you? You know, everyone has their own style. No, I just copy and paste everything. <laughs> <laughs> a, a press release fiend, yeah. Uh, just on that as well, I, I forgot to say what sort of inspired me to get into journalism. It was the old games magazines, you know, Nintendo official magazine, N64 magazine. And I remember going to like this careers day at my old school uh, when I was about, I don't know, 14, something like that, 15. And um, there was this guy behind the desk, of the, the sort of journalism area, and there was no one there. And he looked like a typical hack, you know, he was a bald guy with glasses, sort of middle-aged. And he was like, I'm so glad someone's come to find out about journalism. Of course, now it's really popular and everyone wants to be a journalist, but well, a lot of people do. He basically said to me, to get your foot in the door now, you know, call up a magazine you, that you're interested in and try and get, uh, I don't know, just like visit them. And that's what I did. I called up Nintendo Official Magazine and got like a tour of the uh, of the office and they showed me how they do things, how they review games. Because back then it wasn't all download games. It was the, uh, I think it was like, yeah, the N64 at the time or the GameCube. And they'd have to use like a special machine to like uh, you know connect the the machine connect the console to the PC so they could take screen grabs. You know it's so old fashioned. And then from there I did work experience with them when I got a bit older, and that's why I realised I wanted to write about games. You know, um, but I was useless at news. I mean, I'm I, I still don't think I, I'm still very critical of my writing. I don't think I could be a lot. I think I could be a lot better at news. But it was working on the likes of MCV, and I was sitting next to the guys that. Uh, put together the develop magazine for for games developers and they're just guys like rob crossley and will freeman rob crossley is such a good news hound and go and have a look i'll I'll put a a link in the description to this video on on youtube he interviewed valve like years ago probably like six seven years ago it's like a three or four part interview with like gabe newell and it's just such a great interview when you read it even now gabe sort of predicts what would happen in the games industry you know and rob he got that right Rob also, I think when he was at Games um, GameSpot, he did all the stuff around uh, Wisa 
you know, all the bad publicity they had. That was due to one of his interviews where he really grilled them. And there's a funny sort of Richard Lewis video on that out Rob there Crossley. as well. Yeah, Rob Crossley, you know. Uh, anyway, I'm waffling, guys. O Ollie, did you want to add to that? Add to um, reading other publications and what your habits are to improve? Yeah, I mean, when I, when I first started, like I said, I came from professional tax world. When I first gave my first piece to Red Bull, he was like, there is not a single piece of grammar wrong in this piece. It's absolutely fantastically written, <laughs> but it reads as boringly as a tax report because that's just the style that I was so used to yeah. writing. Yeah. Um, I was used to writing these industry analysis, functional analysis, economic analysis, where you have to research these companies, you have to research the industry, you have to look at their like debt levels. It was that dull, but um, equally that was producing forty-five page reports on these companies. But so the grammar and that stuff was never, never really a problem. But yeah, I mean, I've been a football fan all my life. Before that, I'd done some, um, I'd done match reports for my local paper I've done little things yeah. just because it was fun and i enjoyed it um so yeah i mean i, I always read mainly sports press but yeah I, i've read countless things obviously and, and yeah like you said when you when you read some of the features done um from outside the esports world and you read yeah. the way that they structure them and the read the, the way they do everything it's um yeah it's, it's definitely esports journalism still has a long way to come um until you have consistently top-notch stuff that you do mm -hmm. in in the traditional world really yeah, definitely. Um, I just want to say as well with news, like I was used, I remember, so when I did all that stuff with Nintendo Mag, the work experience, they said to me, like, to get a job here, you don't need a degree, but they recommended it. They were like, if you get a degree, you'll learn other skills and it's just good to have, it's easy to get a job. So I went to Bournemouth Uni, did multimedia journalism, and I was just hopeless at news. I remember one week, our lecturer, Dan Hogan, he said, like, right, you've all got to go out and get a local news story. And we all had our different patches, our different areas. And I remember walking around my area in um, uh, in, in Bournemouth. Uh, God, I can't... Adam Chine, this little tiny area in, in Bournemouth on the, on the coast. And I remember walking around desperately trying to find a news story. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, I eventually found, like, a planning notice up on, like, this lamppost. And it said something like... Uh, uh, there's a building on the way building planning permission granted blah 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 so i thought i'll write about this they're developing here right they're growing the area they're developing i wrote about it and uh the next week when i got my uh, feedback i picked up my form and my lecturer had written on it he's like uh reasonably well written dom but uh what the fuck is this you've written about a block of flats it's like, it's like the most boring thing it was like a see me you know we need to talk about this yeah. i was just i couldn't find the story but since then my first job was at auto trader because I, I couldn't find any jobs in games journalism when i graduated so i worked at auto trader for a couple of years and i just realized news is basically just anything that makes you go oh that's interesting that's happened you know um yep so-and-so signed to a new team or, or whatever there's been a falling out or something interesting and as soon as i as soon as that sort of clicked i just i really loved news i like it now more than features and more than interviews and things just because i i just wish i had more time to do it basically um but with you guys what, what what's your sort of specialties what do you enjoy focusing on what brings the best out in news it features news a bit of both um i'm yeah i mean i'm interested in writing like a bit of both because i'm i do i'm quite known to well at least ollie anyway for staying up to like 5 a.m in the morning looking at american press releases about esports <laughs> and then and then putting out a, a wonderful article about that but um features are interesting when i can more or less get around to dealing with it like uh because it because it usually takes time and they're not always fun and all that I'm, yeah, you need so to I put the just... research in. Duck, where yeah, are you going? I'm turning Blanks' headset down because I can hear my own voice and it's quite annoying. I thought you were trying to get out of the discussion panel. You're like, yeah, it's tempting, right but no. Like... <laughs> <laughs> all, all I could hear was like, just my own voice was like, what is going on? <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's fine. And, uh, uh, okay then. Right. Yeah, um,. It it just it just depends on what I'm feeling on the day and whatever. And yeah. it's, it is mostly just finding a press release and write about them. Very cool. Um, I'm conscious we've I've waffled for a bit and I've got a long list of 
discussion points to get through. So on my point around news, maybe we could start with like how someone asked earlier in the chat, what is it like being an esports journalist and how do you get a story? So does do one of you guys want to go for that one, answer that one? Um, I'll tell you, there's two types. Um, well, there's so many types, but business to business side, I wish that people sent press releases, in which case I could just re remove all the glorified rubbish about how every organisation is the leading esports organisation in the world. Cough Mike Stubbs, Mike Stubbs loves publishing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a nice digger like that. But no, I mean, business technically, like, for example, our parent company is a gambling news company, and I get 10 press releases every day about the gambling industry, whether it's the release of a new slot machine, the appointment of a new CEO. That's fine. It all comes into your inbox. You then choose what you want to write about what news to report and you publish it in esports that doesn't happen you see 10 p.m on a friday night cloud nine revealed that they've got 17 19.7 million investment you're like and it's on it's on twitter there's no email you're like come on guys yeah. this is business to business can you just send the, the very few business publications there are out there can you send us a press release so we can publish this because people want to read about it and people if they miss your tweet they don't even pin it half the time they don't embed it that nothing so yeah. <laughs> it's painful and then the other thing that really annoys me about esports is from the consumer side you basically find out most even by twitter or reddit so a lot there's there's new sites out there that literally their content is dictated by reddit mm. for big dota 2 news websites the news appears on reddit and then they will write an article about the reddit thread which initially reports it so for me it's like if you if you read reddit then you find it anyway so these websites don't really serve too much of a purpose mm. for me but but they are out there they do exist um I don't know if there's much of a future for... I mean, you saw gamers disappear and stuff, uh, so I don't know how much of a, of a market there is for, for these companies that kind of just take Reddit and put it into a website. But, yeah, I don't know. They drive a lot of traffic, so... Mm. Do you know what I, I mean, want to say? The area... Yeah, go on, go on. Go, just back kind of to the original question that was like, how do you get a story? There's also kind of the stories that you get yourself. So I, they're quite... Go out and look for stories find them but like there are what i find a lot in esports and you see this a little bit more than i like is things get reported on so like if someone told me something that was an exclusive and like no one else knows but i know um and if it's something that is unless i have the hard proof in front of me mm. if someone just comes up to me and is like oh that guy just stole ten thousand dollars off me like unless i can see physical proof of that myself a lot of a lot of places will just go Shit, yeah, that's news, right? Without kind of fact checking, without yeah. checking if this guy's if this guy's lying, if this this guy might have an ulterior motive to try and get that guy in trouble, um, and that happens way too much in esports. So, yeah, definitely. if like my rule, my rule for getting a story is minimum two people have to tell me the same thing, or I have to be able to see it with my own eyes. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, that does mean there's been times where I've been told something and thought, shit, this could be a story, uh, and then looked into it, and then two days later, someone else has published a story. And I'm like, yeah, okay, fair enough. That probably was real. And like, I could have had that, but at the same time, it, like, if it turned out to be wrong, then be, I'm, I'm in the shit. You'll be fucking screwed, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's a life. difficult yeah. balance uh, to get right. I will say... Yeah, it's, yeah, go on. It's just also like a lot of the stuff that you hear in esports, because it's because there's so many still examples of people like outside of the top tier esports where, you, where you're looking at the big guys coming in now. Outside of that, you've got so like it's so young there's so many people doing stuff all these people don't particularly have business experience mm. and things going wrong and equally these guys often more often than not don't go to a journalist guys like if, if, if you have an issue in which like something's happened and you feel like you've been hard done by for most of the case it's not oh i'm going to publish this in the press and hunt them down it's go to a lawyer it's illegal like come on like if if, if you feel like you've been defrauded out of money go to a lawyer <laughs> You need to go. You need to go and speak to people yeah. that can help you legally. You don't need to speak to a journalist and turn this into like some sort of turf war. Because equally, mm. I, I mean, from a business to business side, we're not going to go on our platform. We're not going to go publish and rubbish a business for whatever. We, we like on on hearsay on whatever. But if you feel like you've been done out of something and if something's gone wrong, it's not a case. Equally, from a journalistic perspective, if you. Like I, I don't know a huge amount about media law, but there's, there's, you have to be very, very careful about how you report things that could legally lead on to things for your own sake. I mean, esports is very different than if you went and did that from a traditional side because most people don't know it themselves. So mm, whatever, but you, you do need to be careful. Exactly, you need to be careful. Um, and and people need to realise that not everything needs to be a story. Not everything needs to be drama. You could just go about it in a normal way. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not quite there yet. I guess. Makes it a good story though. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't say that's a good story. Um, yeah, a couple of things on those points uh, you made, Ollie. First of all, Reddit. Reddit is a good source of news, but you guys are right. You know, you have to fact check. There's a lot of crap, uh, for want of a better word, uh, that goes up on Reddit. There might be elements of truth in there. There might be just someone's opinion. They don't like someone. They've written about them. I remember a while back, um, uh, uh, someone wrote something on Reddit. It was about um, a streamer, Grosscore, who I write about a little bit on Esports News UK because he's a big UK League of Legends streamer. And this was around the time when he got banned from Twitch and had depression issues or something and went into hospital. Someone wrote about this. Um, it was Trid, the, the caster, the well-known UK caster. And he put up a, a, a piece on Reddit. It was pretty well written. It was basically what had happened. And um, I messaged him later in the day saying, oh, nice uh, piece on, on Reddit. Uh, good journalism or something like that. And uh, he said, that wasn't journalism. I went, of course it was. You've, you've basically fact-checked. Uh, you've checked. You, you've reported on the... the the incident and you've written it up into a story just because it was published on reddit it doesn't mean it's not a story you know and he was actually doing journalism and i think where content is content creation has changed so much now and there's there's been a lot more sort of staff cuts you know uh, uh, bigger sites uh, national newspaper sites local newspapers it's that that gap has been filled by people writing stuff who they're not journalists and they're writing things on Facebook, on Twitter, on Reddit, but they don't have journalism skills. Like Trid's piece was fine, it was good, but for every piece that's written by someone like Trid, there's a piece that's like full of spelling errors. It's, it's inaccurate. There's no fact checking, and accuracy is one of the most important things of journalism. You know, what do you guys think about Reddit? Uh, I guess particularly Mike and Michael. In relation to journalism, does it help you guys do your job, or do you see it as a no. hindrance? No. Uh, the the issue with Reddit is it one, it's a place where you get you you can source news and whatever. Um, half the time, it is a cesspit of idiots who think they know what they're talking about, but mostly <laughs> don't. Two, it's a place where you 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 get exposed for your articles. Um, unfortunately, that means. Uh, good quality journalism and good quality articles usually get outweighed by absolute dross um, <laughs> because because those are the things that 13 year old idiots on reddit think are funny and hilarious whereas things that are actually interesting and should be good and widely accessible and shared to all people because mm. sometimes it can be important things around player welfare or uh, conflicts of interest or whatever ignore this um, <clears throat> should really be spread more um, reddit it's a it's a terrible medium and I think Mike might possibly agree with half of that or disagree entirely. It depends mm -hmm. on what he's going to say next. <laughs> I, mean, I, I agree. I agree that there's a, a lot of issues with Reddit and I think, um, I think uh, in certain subs, I'm going to say this diplomatically, in certain subs there is issues with how it's ran from the top down um, in regards to what is and isn't allowed. So, I make it no secret that I'm not the biggest fan of some of the biggest names in esports journalism, but the fact that some of, some of them are just straight up banned from mm -hmm. uh, certain subreddits, like if they write something, it's just not allowed on there. And mm -hmm. when they're producing, admittedly, some of the better content out there, that seems incredibly unfair. And I think Reddit has an issue with the people at the top, and that filters down to the people at the bottom. Mm -hmm. The one positive of Reddit is if you're ever in a position where I realise this is a position probably not many people have been in, if you are in a position as a journalist where you've got a proper news gig, so I've had things with the past writers, I have to have five news stories in a day. Mm. Now, if you're already writing about Counter-Strike and you've got to do five news stories in a day, chances are you're going to get four of them from Reddit, if not more, mm. um, because that's where everything is congregated and it's just kind of a time saver. So there is positives to it. Like In that situation, Reddit's kind of a godsend because you can go to one website and go, right, there's a story, there's a story, there's a story. Um, but at the same time, the the way that Reddit runs and the stuff that is on Reddit is incredibly bad. And like one of the publications that I write for, I get bonuses based on if it hits certain view milestones. Mm. Um, and you can clearly see the best articles that I've done on that website, like traffic wise, are the ones that have made it to the front page of a Reddit. So in that situation, and for getting in traffic, like if you own your own website, getting on the front page of Reddit is absolutely great because that's where the traffic comes in. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, Reddit has some fundamental issues with it, and I'm not the biggest fan. Yeah, it's, yeah. You just like if, you need to if you write and you see your post going to Reddit, you need to have a thick skin because they they tend to just say stupid yeah. stuff. I mean, like if you if you're hiding behind a keyboard, you've got the veil of anonymity. It's a problem with everything in video games. Like toxicity reigns supreme. It's pretty. I mean, sometimes you get great feedback. I've had front page ones that are like this is a great article blah blah, blah. And you're like oh that's nice mm. sometimes this is the one this is my favorite ever comment i have it saved this article is really hot i've always wanted to see someone sucking flies dick but i never thought it would happen yet someone at red bull was kind enough to answer my dreams with this comprehensive world-class deep throat of the handsome and talented <laughs> captain of og two-time major winners but yeah that, and that's that still to this day is my favorite my favorite red reddit comment from <laughs> any friend that i've had um it, it, yeah but you get feedback sometimes it's like this is sometimes you, this is garbage do you even have an editor and you're like all right okay and they've made two spelling mistakes in their retort to use <laughs> <laughs> i like do you know the best one i had was something uh i can't remember what it was now i think i wrote about choke gaming's demise a while back and half the comments i don't know if it was a vocal minority or not they're saying i was getting it wrong i didn't get it wrong because they're nowhere near what what they are now is nowhere near what they were like uh, before you know and they were dormant for a yeah. while and I think one of the funniest comments I had was, well, I found it funny anyway, was someone going, um, this is a disgraceful article. There's so many uh, like untruths in it. I demand to speak to your boss, the owner of the site. I went, that's me. <laughs> Feel, Hi, free to <laughs> Feel free to ask me any questions, but I'm not pulling the article. You know, and I, you guys are right. You know, I've read it, it. It's like a friend and a foe in a way. You know, I, I hate some of the subreddit rules where you have to post share nine other bits of content before you can post one from your own site i understand where they're coming from there but i just i just feel like they should have like a separate submit button for journalists you know you, if you can prove you work full-time for espn mm. or a site you should be able to upload well, not the crazy amounts but you know one a yeah. day i don't i don't think days. it's a problem for these big publications because yeah, if you write for espn yeah. it gets shared anyway it's, it's for the guys that are writing yeah. like if you're writing a uk csgo article i don't know like it's probably not yeah. going to make the main csgo subreddit if you wrote that and they was like shadow banned you because it'd be unreasonable <laughs> oh yeah, yeah i mean it's like it's like uk dota right there was yeah. uk dota doesn't get anything apart from yesterday well, um one of the more popular streamers um like went on a massive rant about FPL, so that made the front page of Dota 2 subreddit because she's known right. to the Dota 2 community. Um, but yeah, the UK is generally there just for a, a bit of a shit and a giggle, really. Basically, anything <laughs> negative about UK CS just goes straight to the top of uh, Gobo Fences subreddit. <laughs> half, the, half the time I write the bloody thing, so it's always fun. <laughs> nice, nice. No, it, it is nice. Like I say, it's a bit of a friend and a phone. It's a friend when, yeah, if your story does get picked up, you do get a burst of traffic. Um, I've had a few stories on the front page of the league subreddit and that's always nice I had one the other week where uh, it was around a rumour of like the LCS coming to the UK is it going to happen is it not and I th in the headline or well, in there I'd put something like this suggests that another rumour may be true and uh, Mark Merrill one of the co-founders of Riot put something in like this new news at 10 just in rumour of rumour may, may or not be a rumour or something like that and I was like yeah, I'm proud to have that quote. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that on on Twitter. Whether I'm right or wrong, you know, I think it's good to like get interest from people because that's ultimately that's another part of journalism, right? Is to spark debate and write about things that people aren't talking about at the moment and maybe should be like in, important topics and things like that. You know. Um, mm. Anyway, I'm waffling again. Let's get let's get back to this list. So. I wanted to talk about like st off the record stuff and protecting sources because I get this a lot and not a lot of people understand it. Um, it I think in UK sports it's, it's difficult because you have a lot of young people who they'll come to me, tell me information and then I'll say, oh, like I'm planning on doing an article on this or and then it'll be like, oh, no, no, please don't. But then I'll say, oh, obviously, I won't name you and things like that. But I think people, some people don't understand that the whole, like, anonymity thing and how it works, you know. It's just, mm. it's a source at that point. Um, and it depends how much you trust them, right, whether you, you believe them or not. But um, what, what are your guys' thoughts on, like, getting info in off the record? Have you had any particular uh, uh, I think... examples of weird, interesting 
I mean, not. I mean, I, I understand people's concerns because at the moment esports is still like so on the ground level. The people that are working in esports are kind of doing it as like their dream job or whatever. So mm. these people, like, although you say right, you'll be unnamed, and, and sources suggest right, if if the employer, so say you've got a story about one company, um, and that person is part of I don't know, like five or six, like there's five or six employees, only five or six are privy to that information, and it gets mm. leaked to. Dom Sacco, but who in our company knows Dom Sacco? It, it can get pieced together very quickly. It can damage mm. reputation. Mm. So I understand why people tread carefully. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, I, I get told... That the thing is, 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 is it appropriate to publish? Where does, where do you publish it? Do people actually find it interesting? Mm. Um, is it, again, you have to fact check because you're going off rumours, you're going off whatever. So it's always quite difficult. And and like Mike said, he, he waits for like two people to say... yeah to say whatever is that even enough sometimes who knows because two people could be singing off the same hymn sheet that hate what other guy is it's so mm. difficult yeah um i'm I'd, like uh so i can re i can remember something recently because i uh, uh fairly recent anyway with the whole e6 slash reason gaming stuff mm. uh this is before i was uh, involved in reason gaming again so just just like just to cover that my back once again um uh, getting information about some of the other teams involved was like getting blood out of an actual stone, uh, because it was well, it was more than just recent gaming involved in this investigation, mm. and this and it's like uh, I still can't. It's like some some of these email some of these emails to players. I still cannot uh, understand why. I was like, look, uh, you're completely anonymous. There's about five, six, seven, eight. There's about there's about there's about fifteen people involved, and they can't all blame just one of you. So it's fairly safe. You know, mm. uh, but they still just like, oh, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. Um, and then you just go, right, so I've got, so, and, uh, so eventually, eventually when I got a copy of some and the people were like, oh, you've got it off of this one person, it's the exact same one. And it's like completely different thing. It's like, there's so much news and I could save you guys a lot of hassle mm. from being screwed over behind the scenes by what is, uh, uh, which is, which is by what is a potentially sketchy um move from a from a fairly well-renowned organization mm. and they were like nah i just don't care do i it's like mm, come on um speaking of that though uh some of your off the record sources are brilliant dom like uh comments towards smoother in that reason gaming article was quite it's quite funny <laughs> um so that's only because the person said to me happy for you to use that as a quote and i was like i'll take that i'll take do anything it. i can get you know um yeah i, I get it a lot it it, but you know, I have some people I, who I really trust. I have, I even have some people now coming to me with anonymous emails. I don't even know who these people are. Insiders at different companies that send me emails, and I really appreciate what they do because they understand that it's good to get the truth out there, and it's it's important that people like us know what's going on, and we've got like um, we're accurate, you know. Because we don't want to put something out there that's inaccurate. So I appreciate those guys that do help me in DMs and things like that. I, you know, I've got a good assortment of people now, and I think UK esports is different as well. I think people are willing to help because it's grassroots, it's small, you know, at the moment, and anything they can do to help, like get better coverage, it helps the scene in a way. You know, good, whether it's good or bad. Because there's that whole old saying, there's no such thing as bad publicity, right? And I think that's some orgs I speak to certainly have that stance. Some companies have that stance, not everyone. But um, yeah, I, I do think like it, it's so important to have like a real mix of trusted people, trusted yeah. sources you can go to. But to build that trust up, it's not easy. And for me, I think because of the kind of articles I write, sometimes write drama articles, that puts people off, you know? So it's taken me a long time to build up trust in the scene, I think. Um, uh, one thing, I, I know you, you wanted to cover this one, Mike, um, covering events and what not to do when you have press access. I think that's, huh. that's yeah. a good point to cover. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of what I do is going to events. Um, and I'm very fortunate that I get to go to I occasionally go to like normal games events as well. So like if a game's coming out and uh, they do a preview event, I get mm. to go for that. And in in the world of normal games journalism, the, this is a thing that I've kind of noticed a little bit. Like 
and I'm not I'm not gonna, I'm not saying I'm comparing these two people, but let's say if I go to a press event with like Cliff Blazinski, who is a, who is a big time game developer, mm. hundreds of thousands of people, and I'm seeing his game and I'm interviewing him, like not a single journalist on that trip is gonna go, Oh Cliff, can I take a selfie? Can can I get your autograph? Mm. Can I something like that? Whereas if I go to an esports event, there might be like a player that's probably half as well known as Cliff Brzezinski, like probably has 50k Twitter followers or something like that. Mm. You'll see loads of journalists go up, like when they come into the press room to do an interview, you'll see, can I have a selfie? Can I have an autograph? Like all that. And that really, I'm if, surprised if, I, that. if I see that, if I see that and I know who the person is, then if I'm ever in a position to send someone to an event, <laughs> I'm just not going to send that person. But like if, even if they're the only person there, I wouldn't send them because it gives such a bad look to the publication. It's like, uh, and I think I think there's a way of going about things, and this is how I kind of try to pre- present myself. Is whilst at times, yes, I'll be an idiot, I'll make mistakes, I'll have a laugh, I'll be the clown of the event. I'll never go up and embarrass the. I'll never be put myself in a situation that embarrass the publication I'm writing for. Mm. Um, I think. And like I get it, if you're if you're a kid that's doing this for volunteering, and you just want to meet your pro players, and by all means, like enjoy it, say hi, just like enjoy what you've got. But never, if you could, if you really insist on doing it, at least fucking don't do it in the middle of the press room. But guys, don't do it at all because that press access is. If if you fuck it up, then let's say the like I don't know, a big newspaper came in and sent someone that said they knew esports to an event, mm. say like it's on Cologne or something like that, and the person they sent just runs around taking selfies with everyone and like tries to get on camera in the back of the stream and stuff like that it just looks unprofessional and then they're going to get such a bad rep that they're probably not going to work with that person again and that not only fucks it up for that person it could fuck it up for say someone else who then goes oh i'll pitch them an esports article and then they go actually the experience we had with the last person was so bad that we're not going to take that Mm. so it's just kind of have common sense like just you're there, press passes mm. get you access to events for free, which is absolutely amazing. Like, the, And then you also get little perks. Like, generally, usually there'll be a press room where there is good internet access, which a lot of events is at a premium. Mm. Um, and it also means it's the way you can just go sit down, have a chill, be away from the main area. You get so many perks as press. Just be respectful. Don't take the piss. Do and also, what? when you're in the press room, don't piss off other journalists. Because as this shows, we all know each other. We all talk. Mm. If you turn around and tell me to fuck off in the middle of the press room, then you're all going to know about it. Yeah. And then that's going to spread. And you're going to have such a bad rep in esports, especially journalism. It's so small. That eventually, that'll get back to the people with the money. That'll get back to the people that are hiring for the jobs you want. And then you fucked it for yourself, haven't you? Yep, definitely. And those kind of things, when they get on Twitter... Yo. when they sorry. get on. Sorry, I was just going to say, when those kind of things get on Twitter or get on Facebook uh, journalism groups, they can spread like wildfire and you're right they can really damage your reputation i will just say really quickly with like um i did this grassroots esports panel at agx the other week and the organizers asked me do you have any pictures of you like interviewing players or whatever and i i looked at my um uh, computer files and really i didn't I, i had to get screen grabs from videos and it made me realize like i do have a couple of pictures but it was kind of instilled in me on my day's at MCV, not to ask for freebies and things. I was never like that anyway. I don't feel comfortable doing it with Gamergate and everything as well. It just, you know, it reinforced that. I, I, won't, I don't go out my way to do that. Some people will just brazenly go up to companies and go, oh, you got any free headsets? You got any free stuff you can give me? And yes, that is a perk of the job. You might sometimes get freebies. I never really ask for them. And this is a, a really good reason. I just I don't feel comfortable doing it w- with the job. Yeah. You know, if if someone emails me and said we've got this thing for review, I mean, let's have a thing in esports. I don't really need to review products. I've done a couple for my site. You know, e- esports is kind of different. But I, I will just say, uh, Mike, on the selfie front, I have had a few selfies over the years, but I would never go up to someone like straight away and just do it. Usually, it's I've done an interview. And you might find this, guys, you'll do an interview with someone and you'll get like the PR or someone else going, oh, do you want a photo? And at that point, I'd feel rude to say no. (laughs) I mean, like, no, I don't want a photo with you. I know who would say that, you know, so I always say yes. And um, that's just nice to have like in your portfolio if you have a few pictures with people. But I think for me, if I'm like a big fan of that person, say I'm interviewing a big League of Legends player or something like that, 
Uh, I did this with Snoopay a few years back before I set up Esports News UK. I, I got a selfie with him afterwards, after the uh, um, interview, just because I wanted to remember the interview, you know, and I was getting into Esports. So, are you with me on that in that regard, Mike? It's a different kind think, of approach. Yeah, I think there's times and a place like if a lot what the way to do it if you really want to do it is go, Oh, I need a picture for the top of my article. Right. If you're insistent on doing it, then just mm. say that. But if you're like I've seen it before, um where and to be fair, the event in question, which I'm not gonna name, was a little bit at fault for the way they set up their interview things. But basically what happened was the press room was upstairs and the players would be led up the stairs put in the press room mm. and then it was kind of just a free-for-all for whoever you could grab mm. and that some of the bigger players like they just you wouldn't be able to get an interview for five minutes because all of these there'd be like 50 journalists just go around it's like selfie 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 that's selfie selfie it's like oh, get a grip I'm surprised you don't need that's, that that's yeah. that, that's surprising yeah because the only time I've ever come across journalists um taking selfies with other players and stuff is when it's people on their own blogs or for their or for like small sites or whatever mm. That they say are esports news sites, but are just pretty much blogs they run themselves. Um, in terms of getting free stuff and whatever, uh, I've only I've literally and I had that once, it was, and it was just literally just thrust in my face. I was like, uh, "What? Well, okay, I'll take this." <laughs> uh, it, 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 when you when you literally handed something, is in any sort of aspect, it's like, "Okay, I feel quite weird now." Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. it can be awkward. <laughs> I yeah. think there is there is also so. An area that a lot of people probably don't see, and this is definitely something that I feel might be an advantage of mine from my games journalism days, is that I know a lot of PRs. Um, so people that like will send out the announcements that will invite you to the events that mm. settle the interviews, stuff like that. Um, I have a lot of contacts with them, and some of them I'm on really good terms with, known them for years, been to all their events, so get on really well. And it's kind of if they're repping a client that is a hardware client, and they go, right, we've got this client. Is there anything you want to do around them? I might go, yeah, sure, I could do this. And then they'll go, oh, do you want me to send you whatever this person is doing? Mm. And like, because I have that good relationship and I know that they're not going to get on my back and all that sort of stuff, then I'll probably say yes, just because it can add that extra little bit of depth. So like, if I did something recently that I don't think has gone live yet, but um, will do soon, uh, about a gaming chair company who the founders are like mm. old starcraft players yeah so i've done a big feature on that and um, an interview with the guys who set it up about like well why why would you stop playing starcraft to go make chairs um and it's actually quite interesting their story mm. and then the the pr behind it was like oh well we've got some chairs do you want one and like i get on very well with the pr mm. and I'd, i'm not going to your chair because the chair's worth about 500 quid and that would be a little bit <laughs> over the top but if that was something that was like oh if it was a headset or something like that i might say yeah mm -hmm. because then i can go instead of just saying they make really good chairs I, or headsets mm -hmm. they make really good headsets i could go i've used this headset i know that they make really good headsets so maybe it probably was a good idea to stop playing starcraft mm -hmm. um so i think the relationship is key i would never turn around to a pr or a company that i've never interacted with i just go here, give me some shit. I might write about it. Like that, just, no. Nah. But if it's a relationship that I know, like there's certain PRs that I go well with, and I know they're not going to be mad at me if I turn around and ask for some, and I know that like it's just going to work. Yeah, definitely. It's um, it's weird. The the selfie thing I complained about at TI because in TI there was a lot of. Um, so TI, the international Dota's biggest event, 25 billion prize money, all the players are there in the day before the main event in the press room. Obviously very stressful and yeah, there's a lot of people taking selfies and then on Twitter actually, I was I was like flying back or something. So I just woke up to about 50 notifications when I landed of people like debating it. And to be fair, I, I mean, I, I don't particularly like, if you've done an interview, then mm. do I see it? It is, I mean, TI was very, very, very well organised, which I don't normally say about anything that Valve are involved in at all. But you booked your slots before. Each team was in the room for an hour. Sometimes the teams were literally floating about. I've been to so many Dota events that I know some of the players very well anyway. I don't feel the need to have a selfie with them because I don't, it'd be weird, like me going up to my mate in the street and going, let's, let's have a selfie or whatever. I, don't, I wouldn't do that. But equally, if you look at the traditional world of press, like take, I don't know if any of you listen to TalkSport. Yeah. Um, or, you know, Ian Abrahams. Yeah. Ian Abrahams 
every single day he the moose. posts pictures the moose he posts happy birthday to my friend like jack butland and he has a selfie with him he has a selfie with pretty yeah. much every footballer like down to gillingham division two players like i'm not even joking yeah the guy's like oh happy birthday to my mate paul shaw he plays up front for gillingham he's 39 today and he's got a selfie with him and then it goes all the way up to sanchez and ozil and you're like Right, so it, it is done in the traditional world. Admittedly, I've spoken to people in traditional yeah. sports worlds and they all think that Moose is a complete and utter cock. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's building up his brand, right? And that's what I want to come on to as well. In journalism, we write necessarily that anyone will report badly. Oh, sorry. I, I sorry, I think I went full there, robot there. I think my internet just cut out briefly. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was I just saying, right? I, don't, I don't think it will necessarily go back and make your publication look bad. Yes, when it's a free-for-all and people are just going in when there's people trying to ask questions. Yeah. I think that looks stupidly bad because that's not... If a player has limited time and you haven't booked a slot and it's not that well organised, then the time should be used. If it, especially if it's like post-match, it should be used to do the reflection and the proper work. Mm. It's like you wouldn't get someone running up to Jose Mourinho post-match at a United game and trying to take a selfie. They're there and they're going to try and answer the questions to then produce pieces which are good rather than like running up and taking a selfie selfie with Mourinho it's not going to happen so yeah I, I agree with Stubbsy on that, that part don't, I will say, don't do just it just to count, yeah. count one point that you said there Ollie I've had a publication before where I went to an event on behalf of them um, and it was a publication that I worked with a lot so they were kind of a little bit chill um, but they were just like I don't need to tell you this but like don't be a dick and they specifically said don't go around taking selfies oh I was like God. who do you think I am but like, yeah, they, they were like, yeah, I think it looks really bad, personally. Um, I mean, I mean, again, different editors think on, differently, right? As well, it depends so. on the situation. But I've definitely had editors come up to me and say, just like, don't take selfies, don't embarrass yourself because it'll get, it'll embarrass us. Um, I mean, equally, I yeah. Like at TI, so many people are there and they're meeting these players for the first time. Some of them have come from like Brazilian outlets where they're working for like smaller blogs. Some of them, I didn't know this, but they're YouTubers. And obviously then it makes a world of sense to have. Yeah. Like they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're, I looked at this guy, right? I never met him. He was speaking Spanish or whatever. Anyway, I looked him up afterwards and he has infinitely more subscribers than I would ever imagine most people I've ever met have had. He, he was huge in, in Brazil. So him taking selfies, although I was like, who is this guy? I've never met him before. He's obviously not an esports journo. Mm. He was there from a traditional game side, from a YouTube side, and pushing TI content out to a massive base of people. And he was asking for selfies, so I don't really have the right to be annoyed at him. Yeah. There's certain things it gets on, it does get on my back at times as well. But I mean, yeah, generally, as long as you're not completely ridiculous and over the top with it, yeah, I, I kind of agree with with what's been said. So, yeah, and I will just say on events, guys, Richard Lewis pointed this out in one of his videos in how to get into journalism and things going to events is so important because in this really digital world of esports you get to actually network with people in real life you know which uh, everyone's on skype and twitter and things like that yeah. and dming each other and to actually talk in person i think every single event i go to big event like egx or insomnia um uh esl prem finals i'll usually get a story just out of talking to people you know whether it's a rumor or or whatever that I can follow up on. I think it's so I important just, to network. To mm. add on that, like I've, I always say this: if you see me at an event and you want to get into esports journalism, by all means, come up, say hello, yeah. and I, I might not help you there and then. But if you hit me up on Twitter afterwards and go, right, this is what I've done. If I think you're good, like, if, I've always said this, and I do this for a few people. Mm. If you're good, then I will 100% help you. Um, I mean, there's one writer who is kind of does a bit of CSGO stuff. She also does a lot of normal game stuff. I met her on a press trip to Berlin mm. to go play Epic Games' MOBA Paragon like two years ago. Oh, yeah. um, Emma Matthews, she's really fucking good. And she was just on this press trip, and it was me and like two journalists that I know really well. And felt a bit bad that we kind of ignored her on the plane over. So afterwards, we went to the bar, and she was just like, oh, yeah, no, I write for a few places, and I just try and get into it. And now, like, if I ever see a freelance call that I think she'll be good for, I'm like, right, there you go. I'll send that to you. Um, That's nice. I, I think like I'm in the fortunate position where I kind of don't need to chase after every freelance call. If something's not something I want to do, I'd have to do it. So I, I always, I've got a group of probably five or six people that all have different areas of specialities where if I see a freelance call, that's good for them. Or I know of an opportunity that will work with them. I'll send it across and I'll try and get them. So again, if you ever see me at an event, come say hello. And who knows, you could join my network of minions <laughs> i'm the same on esports news uk mm. if we get volunteers we have a little skype group and we're just always sharing job openings you know 
uh, internship at Eurogamer or whatever, you know, as a freelance, uh, an esports site looking for a freelancer and so on. And I think that's important to do because when you're volunteering, you want to build up that portfolio, right? And then you want to you want to go and get paid work, you know, and it's not easy um, to do. You say that, there is a, um, it's not easy to do because you've got to know how to do it. And this is also something I'll help you with if you ever want to. But there is a surprising amount. I've been saying this quite a lot recently. There's a surprising amount of money available for esports freelancers mm. because the problem is where the money is changes every six months because so many investors come in and they'll go, right, here's a million quid for a year. Right? Now, if you're a freelancer and a company's got a million quid to run, mm. you're getting some pretty decent rates off that. Right? But the problem is they'll invest a million quid and then six months down the line, they'll go, hang on, we've got 2,000 people reading this website and we've just invested a million quid we're not making any money. And so the money will drop out. Like it can mm. drop out within a week sometimes. So it's very unstable and you've always got to know, you've got to be looking for that next opportunity. But new opportunities come in all the time. I think there's two big websites launching within the next month and a half, mm. each of which reckon they've got hundreds of thousands of pounds of funding for their first year. And it's like, right, okay, I know them too. I'm probably going to do some work for them too. When at least one of them fails in six months' time, yeah. I'll go look for the next one where the money comes in. And so there is the money is there, and there is a lot of money um, available to the point where, like, uh, during uh, the start of the year, so kind of April, May, it was at the stage where I turned down work because I was physically too busy to be able to do things. Mm. Um, so the money's there. The pe people just don't take it because they don't know where it is, which is another problem. Yeah, yeah you're right though, Mike. There is a big opportunity for freelance esports journalists because there aren't many great esports journalists. There aren't many esports journalists out there full stop, really, because it's still relatively new. There's a million games journalists, but there aren't as many esports journalists. So you've got a good opportunity to carve your name. I remember I read the Daily Dot and and uh, uh, you know ESPN and all those sites and the Score. I remember seeing Jacob Wolf like a few years ago on the daily dot and I was like this guy's really good he's writing like exclusive League of Legends news and things like that and I was following him and now he's like one of the senior reporters on ESPN he's made a real name for himself you know and this goes back to what I was saying before find your niche you know Duck writes about CSGO and UK CSGO I write about UK League um, you know whereas Mike yourself and Ollie you have more of like versatile experience I know Ollie you do trade stuff at Esports Insider but Mike is that a challenge for you Mike having to go from one publication to the next because the same article could be very diff different for Eurogamer as it could be for the Telegraph for example that must be a challenge obviously I don't have that challenge yeah um, that is that is and it isn't um, I think the challenge the challenge, the bigger challenge for me is because because I'm very generalist and I cover for these publications that maybe aren't as hardcore as Esports Insider and Esports News UK that are solely esports. Mm. Um, because a lot of my work is on sites that cover kind of everything or games and want to dip their toe in esports. Um, yeah. The trouble, the struggle I have is that I'm not going to be able to go to Eurogamer and go right, let me do 20 articles on Dota a year because they're just not going to like that. Mm. If I go, let me do. 10 articles on esports in general in a year, I'll probably say that. So keeping up with all of the different games and finding the big stories, that's the bigger challenge that I have. And I realise I'm in a very specific position that I do kind of cover all the big esports. Um, but like kind of, there's a yes and no to the different publications. If I'm pitching something to say Eurogamer, I know that the audience there don't know what esports is, but know what video games are. And... So like I'm more likely going to pitch your Overwatches, your Call of Duties, your Fifas because they know what those games are than I am a Dota or a League of Legends because they're probably not going to know what that game is. So if I say X did this in Overwatch, probably 50% of the Eurogamer readership is going to understand that sentence. If I say X did this in Dota, probably 10%. Mm -hmm. So the editors know that as well, so they're probably not going to commission that. Yeah. Whereas if I'm, if I'm writing for, say, Red Bull, that's a little bit more hardcore or a certain esports section. That's where I'll go, right, I can assume that the person reading this article understands what Dota is. So I can use spell names. I can use terminology that's a little bit more hardcore. Um, and then I was on Boomio, the really hardcore Counter-Strike counter website at the start of this year. Mm. And that was actually a bit of a challenge for me because that was kind of 
it wasn't the first, but it was kind of the first big game specific website that I've written for where the fans know everything about that game. Mm. I, I'm not a Counter Strike expert by any means. I'm like silver master. So I'm silver and I'm terrible. Um, I like, for me, try to learn, instead of trying to dumb things down a little bit like I might have Red Bull, I had to like coach myself out of doing that. I didn't have to explain what like a wall banged through mid doors on Dust Two meant. I could just say like someone hit a wall bang through mid doors on Dust Two. I didn't have to explain that. Yeah. That was a challenge for me. Um, mm. And I think you just got to know your audience. It's not necessarily for occasion. It's know the people you're writing for. Yeah. And if you are sending a pitch to a publication, make sure you understand what their audience is. So like I said, we use Eurogamer as an example again. They're never going to take me going, I will do a hardcore analysis of this 65-minute Dota game and tell you everything that happened in it. Hmm. Because Dota fans will love that. They'll like, analysis of Dota game if I'm smart enough, which I'm not. But if I'm smart enough, they would really like that. The readers of Eurogamer are going to go, I don't know what the fuck he's talking about. Why am I reading this? <laughs> so you've got, to, you've got to choose the stories that you tell and where you tell them. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing I wanted to touch... We, we touched on this slightly earlier, guys, like the reactions you get from readers. I've had a mixed bag. I like to think I've, I've built up the respect in general in the UK League community. There are always going to be some people that... Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's my personality, but I just <laughs> can be quite annoying. So I think there's just some people that just don't like me, and that's fine. I have to accept that. I think since writing about esports... I've built up a thicker skin compared to when I was writing just for trade publications. Because when you're writing for trade, it's managers and, and people who are in are working in, in the trade, they're likely to read it and not react, right? Unless you've really got something wrong or you've really written an amazing thing. Whereas in consumer, you're likely to get reactions all the time. So there are, there are a handful of negative ones I get, but in general, I'm pretty pleased. But... I know you gave us that quote earlier, Ollie. Have you had any particularly like challenging readers or people that, no matter what you do, seem to jump on you? Or um, any examples where you've turned it around and you've sort of handled them? Um, I mean, I I tend generally I I don't tend to be too interactive on Reddit. Um, the people that I know that enjoy my content, whatever, that's fine. It's good. When I mean, the thing is, when you when you see when you interview a player that's big in the Dota world or whatever, and he has thousands and thousands and thousands of followers, it gets retweeted. You can read the responses. Sometimes, I mean, I've had people DM me on Twitter and ask me for my full portfolio of work because they want to read everything I've ever written. And I'm like, you don't really want to do that. I've written 400 business to business news articles. Like, come on, you don't want to read that. I'm telling you so that you've now. you've got big fans then, Ollie. I mean, it, it, like sometimes you have people that are just big fans of, I mean, there's certain features that I know when I've written them. And I mean, I think personally, I prefer feature writing. I really like it when you get a really good feature. They're just really bloody hard to come by because yeah. sometimes when you do a Q and a, it then comes out like a Q and a, and I don't think there's any like, yes, asking the right questions. Fine. But at the same time, um, yeah, asking the right questions is, is a, t is a skill that you need to have. Um, and to get the more, most interesting interview you can out of it. But at the same time, it's, it's kind of one type of feature. I have wanted to do more kind of, sort of long form telling a story there are a few journals that do it very 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 well mm. um i haven't had the chance to do too many of them no not you stubs don't you point <laughs> yeah. yourself like that no like will you you know will parton he wrote an artesian yeah. one went out on uh whatever a big publication in canada like it was a massive massive article i don't know where you'd ever get that many words commissioned anywhere in the world um i like <clears> long form writing i've done a few yeah over the exactly. past few months i've really enjoyed putting it together i mean i've I've written 2,500 word articles like crazy. And you get, I get paid the same rate. So it's just mm. out of the, of the passion. Like I could get away with writing 800, but at the same time, whatever, you just you just do what you what you think makes a good piece. Yeah. In terms of feedback, I mean, Reddit, I, I generally won't, if someone comes out with something, I won't get on the defensive and go and fight him because if you do that, you're just going to set yourself up to be kind of witch hunted by these couple of idiots. So <laughs> I kind of just, I read it if I think they've got a fair point. Sometimes I've, I've said yeah. something wrong in my article same. and then I'll, I'll go, and I'll go either to the editor or I'll go into my article and I'll amend it mm. and I just I'll drop a note saying thanks didn't notice that cheers um, but yeah it's it's um, and that happens, I mean I've, right? I 
Yeah, I imagine. I imagine with the kind of smaller niches um, that you guys dabble in, you, you kind of have a lot more interaction with the people that directly read it. Um, especially like UKCS, UK Esports News UK, you have a lot more interaction. They're, yeah. they're quite vocal on Twitter. They're quite like a small, tight knit community anyway, mm. um, which obviously breeds a lot of drama, breeds stories. Any yeah, but with with sort of when you're writing about international Dota and you're interviewing a Malaysian team, then you're hardly going to have too many people come and witch hunt you or mm. say that you're reporting wrong because you're, you're doing features on a Malaysian team at the end of the day and they're all the way over there and you're over here. So. I've, I've had one person, I've, I've wrote about the drama in UK CSGO. I want to clear this up with people watching. I don't write about drama because I enjoy it. I write about it because I feel there's an important point to be made, you know? Oh, Mike, are you still there? We've lost Mike. Lost my this is going to go wrong very quickly. So hopefully, comes I'm watching back the in stream. Um, Obviously, lives up at least his pictures. There. Um, but yeah, I don't write about drama it. for the sake of it, I write about it because I think there's an interesting point to be made. So, the UK CSGO drama I, I wrote about a few months ago involved like uh, potentially underage drinking. But if people actually read oh, the article, one, yeah. they would have seen my point is that. People under 18, people like 15, 16, 17, they're going to drink. Like, you know, yeah, uh, no we've all been done it. I've drunk at, at whatever it was, 16 or 17. You try it one or two with your friends. Like, you're not going to be able to stop that. <laughs> so that's why I wrote about it. I was basically yeah. defending the, the UK CSGO. A lot of people didn't see that because they don't bother to read the articles, uh, some of the young, some people in no. esports, you know. No, so people don't bother reading articles because their attention span doesn't last longer than 30 seconds. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's like, uh, it also talking about UK CSGO and all that, all that lovely fun stuff, mm. uh, I there there's... There's quite, there's, I'm respected by quite a few people in terms of articles and writing things because mm. I know what I do and I do it quite well on, on occasion. Uh, but there's also people who think I'm a cunt, but I also mutually think they're a cunt as well. So, you know, <laughs> it, it equals out. So um, we just don't talk to each other often. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that, and that's literally the only way I can survive in this country, in this, fuck, in this, uh, this, this, this community for anything longer than 10 seconds, whatever. So, yeah. I wanted to say as well, on the CSGO thing, one of the comments I had, I was on holiday at the time and I'd timed some content to go live and I was trying yeah. not to te check Twitter, but I knew that was the day my piece went live and I knew I'd have a lot of notifications. Checked my phone really quickly at lunchtime. I had loads of notifications and there was this one guy who was saying to me, uh, he was just completely negative and um, I retweeted him at one point and... Thankfully, that can be a good technique if you know people that respect you. I retweeted it because I thought it was a weird comment. And I had, lo and behold, like people defending me, which is really nice. I really appreci appreciate that. And I do the same, likewise, I do the same for people when I see it happen to them and journalists and so on. But this person, he was saying to me, like, around the UK CSGO stuff, ha ha, what a waste of life. Like, you're a prick and you're writing about 17-year-olds, ha ha ha. I, so I remember. If, I, if I'm a sports journalist, I can't write about Messi when he was 17 years old. Is that what you're saying? I know it's different comparison, but there are going to be teenage, um, you know, esports players, and that's a problem. Do you know what I mean? I just thought the logic was flawed. Yeah. Um, Mike, are you back with us? I am back. Sorry, someone decided to turn the internet off. That's okay. That's okay. No, <laughs> got back really quickly. Um, so we were just talking about reactions from Drama. readers and, and DMs and things like that. One thing I got, I've got a lot of recently. I don't know if you guys get this. Is being asked to go back and change old articles that are like two years old. And you, you might have seen this has been in the news over the past couple of years, where you, people yeah, can yeah. legally request to change, get things removed from Google, right? But I will say to these people, I'll never go back and change an old article unless it's wrong. Because you're changing, yeah. you're deleting a bit of UK sports history. Do you know what I mean? I've had people saying, can you take my name out of this article? Well, no, because you're a key person that was involved in the news story. Exactly. You know, um, have you guys yeah. had that? Yeah, I've I've literally only done that once. Um, that Which was an article about Smooya being accused of cheating. Uh, which was written by somebody who wrote on UK CSGO. Because uh, um, I, I literally, as soon as the article was published, I was like, can we delete this? Because it's definitely incorrect, because I've researched this before, but it just stayed there for ages. Ah, oh, well, that's different. Um, yeah, if it's yeah, just... And, if it's... And, 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 yeah, I, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't until I was recently made editor, like, a few weeks ago that I managed to finally get the 
bloody thing gone because it was completely incorrect. Are you editor um, now? Uh, yes, I oh, am. Congrats, mate. Well, congrats, well done. Yeah, which Whee! basically means I just write for myself. <laughs> um, yeah. Nice, no, good. <laughs> and I saw blanks in the chat earlier saying um, probably get banned for writing this or something, but we have we're looking for writers. It's like yeah. I'm happy. Like, like I said, yeah, like um, when I started yeah. Esports News UK, I reached out to you guys at UK Cisco pretty much straight away because I just wanted to say hi. And we write about slightly different things. I sometimes cover CSGO stuff, but we have different styles. You're solely UK CSGO. And I think yeah. it's, it's good. For me, a lot of esports journalists get along, you know? And I recommend... Sometimes I get people emailing me saying, I want to write for your site. I ask them, what games do you follow? UK CSGO. It's like, well, we have one person that does some video interviews for us. Here's UK CSGO, you know? So I think it's good to, yeah. uh, to do that. Um, yeah, like... So, yeah, Esports News UK and UK CSGO complements each other very well because you stick to majority League of Legends yeah. and uh, you've got, you also started moving to Call of Duty now with uh, Jacob Hale. Yeah. Which, and that, that, that works uh, brilliant well. Um, we just stick to our lovely, lovely niche of everyone hating each other. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, which, which is perfectly fine. So, and we... We work with you a fair amount, and we plan to do so more in the future. Keep an eye on that, lads. Just uh, saying. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> for the f yeah. So, it's uh, yeah. And like, I will just repeat what was said earlier. If if anyone does want to come write about esports in any sort of shape of um, in a shape or form, mm -hmm. uh, do come to us. We always look to uh, to either me or or Dom because mm -hmm. Dom does all lovely UK esports. And if you want to write Counter Strike. Come to us, have a chat, and see if it's for Definitely. you. Uh, even if you do write a few, uh, like free articles, that's fine. We've used you for some content, and you've had a go seeing if it's your sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. On uh, yeah, I agree. Just just get your if you if you're looking to get into it, then you you like I mine mine is very different from Stubbsy and Ducky, right? Because I have I have a degree in economics, and I went and wrote forty five page tax reports. So. <laughs> Um, I mean, when I when I submitted a written thing, it was he probably read it. It was like that's the most ridiculous thing, whatever. But if I send my CV of A stars at A level and a degree, people look at it and go, "Hang on a second, why the hell do you want to write about people playing computer games? You're an absolute moron. Why aren't you working in the city?" So it's kind of it's very different. But if you need to, like like they always say, right, you need to get your name out there somehow. You need to start from. I looked at doing sports journalism, mm. um, and but then you had to go and do an NCTJ, and I was like, I'm. I've just done 15 tax exams. I can't be asked to go and do more exams. <laughs> yes, the NCTJ is going to be very different in terms of uh, difficulty to doing a dual qualification in chartered accountancy and chartered tax law. But at the same time, it's um, yeah, it's just <laughs> I was like, I don't want to do more exams. I don't want to be qualified in in being a. Uh, but that would have got you into an entry level sports reporting job, right? Mm, yeah. So it's it's different. Esports gives you a unique opportunity. If you like writing and you want to get in and you feel like you have a talent, you feel like you can paint the picture well, you can actually go and get a job as an esports journalist without having all these qualifications, which is very, very unique to this industry. You can't do that in traditional sports. You can't go and become a sports reporter, even for a local paper without an NCTJ. Yep. So it's very unique in that sense. And passion can lead you to it. Whether you start small, a lot of people in esports for some reason recently have started kicking off saying, why on earth do people work for no money in esports? We need to stop this right uh, now. And it's like, because there's no money in esports. <laughs> It's like, guys, just calm, calm it down. Like, there's nothing wrong with having a bit of experience. If you're tournament admining on a for for free, like mm. it, it can it can lead. Yeah. You take you take a look at the UK example with um, Jasmine. Is it no? I've got a name. Yeah, right? Jasmine Canoe. Yeah, Jasmine. Yeah, she's doing very very well. She's off to DreamHack. She's off doing whatever. That came, I assume, from volunteering. She didn't stroll in and go. Yeah, she's, right, uh, she's let me admin yeah. all the time. Like, yeah, so <laughs> she started work. She started uh, working as an admin and uh, what is it? Uh, insomnia and epic lab you know mm. just doing it for free well, coming now for free for a weekend and whatever uh getting screened up by idiot uk counter-strike players but uh you know it, it's it, it gives you a grounding and to be fair she's pretty good at it so yeah, yeah. Uh, same with I'm casters glad she, that she, yeah Cass, casters as well yeah, yeah. They, it's, it's they literally everything off. in each it's literally everything in esports, unless you st unless you start right at the top level because you come off of some other massive business ex mm. experience. You would have started as a volunteer, um, guys. I'm unless conscious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go on. Sorry, uh, Duck. Finish. What no, you, I was joking. What you say? That, I'm done. That's <laughs> okay. what I was saying. 
I, I'm just conscious uh, time. If we try and wrap it up in the little, sort of next fifteen twenty minutes, if we can, um, tying on, um, following on from like being asked to change old articles and change history. The, the next thing I wanted to ask about is like being asked for favors, right? So. I get this quite a bit where people come to me and say, Dom, I've got this contract dispute. So this has happened. like, And they're basically asking me, if it's an interesting story, they know I'll go to their team or their organ or whatever. And I'll say, look, this so-and-so, I've heard this has happened. Can you give me a comment? A lot of the time what happens there is they actually, it forces them to go back to the person that has the problem and they sort out the problem. <clears throat> just because mm. of my intervention, because they're scared of getting negative publicity. I've had people resolve the issue and then go to me and, and I'll say to them, okay, if you've got an official comment, then I'll write this up. It's like, oh no, it's resolved now, it's not a story. It's like, no, that might be the case sometimes, but a lot of the time, if, if there was dispute going on for weeks, it's still a story and I still need to write it. Do you guys get that, where you get people coming to you, asking for favours, and then not respecting the fact that you're still a journalist and you might need to write about it. Uh, yeah, I've had that a couple of times with uh, some players. Um, but I will I will always do it. Um, I don't necessarily mind I can't get a story out of it at the end because I am, well, I will always be and will never stop being pro players. Yeah. Um, uh, if, I, if I can, if, if one small action myself can uh, sort a massive issue out for a player, I will 100% do it all the time. Um, sure, I get. I, I do feel a little burned that I can't write something up afterwards. Um, I might write a, a vague opinion piece that references it, but doesn't name the entire uh, event yeah. in, entirely, uh, which is something I still have to finish up at some point. But yeah, um, but no, I would never. I don't necessarily mind too much. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's worth it to uh, help out what are, what are occasionally mates or uh, just another person in esports i agree i think it depends on the situation right every everyone is mm. different uh mike and ollie what are you have you had any examples there on the freelance uh, and trade I, perspective um i think i think the other day there was a, a really good video done by foreign i don't watch a lot of foreign stuff but some of the stuff he talks about so it was denial he talked about denial esports who are known for being and he was sort of denial esports i don't know if anyone knows but it's a, it's run by a guy called robbie rinigaldi or something Rinaldi, and yeah. he's he has he has a reputation and denial esports have a reputation for owing players money and it goes it goes around in cycles and then they get a new roster and that roster then comes out six months later and it's kind of why it's do they get burned and i mean yeah. i mean his his point was he basically did a video of why do these organizations still exist and the simple answer is is that these the players that are trying to make it somewhere in esports, they want exposure. Where do they get exposure? They get exposure from the likes of Denial Esports, who have that network. Mm. And yes, it will keep happening. Yes, they'll stop. They'll keep not paying players the money. And for some reason, players will still come and play for them because they're still helping out the players. They're still getting them into competitions. Yeah, they're still kinda. giving them that name. So, yes, Denial Esports, they're not good because they they're stealing and they're doing whatever. But at the same time, the ecosystem in esports at the moment is kind of. It's kind of tough, and that's why it's you still have these all. They're never going to go. It happens everywhere in business. There's still examples of rogue organisations, rogue whatever, um, and that that never will go away. But I mean, I I don't personally have any kind of stories as close or relatable as as you guys because typically I'm I'm reporting on a global level rather than in a tight knit community. So I've never had like a a player. I mean, players in, in Dota, if they've had issues, they just go on Twitter and Reddit. That's the mm. bloody one for esports. They don't come to a journalist and say, write this up for me. They say, I'm going to write it in my own blog. <laughs> and that's the way it happens. So, um, yeah, I mean, it just goes back to the kind of immaturity and the youngness of the industry, I guess. Yeah. Have you not had that from a company perspective, though, Oli? Because I remember when I was working on PCR, I had this small independent tech distributor who were getting shafted by Amazon because Amazon, uh, they were sending returns back to Amazon. Amazon weren't acknowledging that they received the returns. So this Disty was getting out of pocket and it was mounting up and up and up until they'd bit up a bill of whatever, 100 grand or whatever it was, out of pocket by Amazon. Weren't getting anywhere with Amazon. So they came to me and they said, Don, we've ummed and armed over this for so long. We need to go to the press because we're out of options. We're running out of money. I called mm. Amazon up, I did my research, called Amazon up, said, do you have a comment? <laughs> Two hours later, 
the Disty, the distributor, phoned me up again and went, Dom, what have you done? Amazon have got onto the phone with us and they've they've agreed to pay us back like 60%. And then again, yeah. I had that thing where they were like, please don't write the article. It's like, I, I have to, because nope. this is a... And then I found out Amazon were doing it to other companies as well. So it was a story by that point, you know? Yeah. Mm. I mean, I mean, uh, I would say in esports, it's you don't. I mean, I don't. I don't particularly have that from my side. But you, you have Rich Lewis, who basically has built his name over God knows however many years as as he posted and he exposes and he he mm. doesn't he doesn't have a filter necessarily on on what he posts and therefore. Um, I mean, investigative journalism is hard at the best of times. Every company in esports is private. You try and find any information about any company, you don't even know what they've registered their company as. It's, it's so difficult yeah. to get information. So investigative journalism is, oh, I smell something fishy here, but how can I get more information? And most of the time, you just can't. It. So, yeah, so yeah, you, you just it's, it's very difficult, and you need to spend a lot of time. And, and generally, do you have the... Do I have the time? I've got, I've got a full-time job. We have to run events. We have to do this, that, and the other. Do I have time to go and chase and sniff down a, a lead that might not even exist? exist no but then you have rich lewis and he does when he gets these big stories out is because people go i have this bullshit story of me being mistreated how do i get it out there who do i talk to yeah rich lewis I've so drop in drop into his dms and yeah. it's, it's and i mean if you if you have a suspicion about something or you wanted to do an investigative piece it's always worth saying all right rich mm. what do you know about this because he knows a lot of random stuff and he gets messages from all over the place about this happening that happening and then eventually it amalgamates in a big piece or a big expose that he'll do mm. um but it's very it's very difficult just from anyone else's perspective to kind of do anything particularly investigative because it's all hearsay and you, you don't really have anything concrete. It's very difficult to look into accounts. You can't. You just can't. So yeah. it's, it's hard. I, I want to say as well, I, I, sometimes I'll, I'll get people saying uh, to me like, oh, you write about these guys quite a bit, Dom. You never write about us. How, how can we get publicity or whatever it's like it's so simple i say this so send many me people. an email just contact me you just just yeah. contact me just dm me i've had people i get it all the time dom we've got an announcement can you write about it well what is the announcement you know you brought a you've you've i don't know you bought a new pc no that's i'm not going to do a, an announcement <laughs> on that you know if you yeah you you're going to DreamHack for the first time, like you're going to be I That's don't know huge, yeah. the, the first uh, you're the first all British PUBG team taking part or something in this new tournament. And yeah, it's interesting, you know. Just just reach out to us. And on that note, I wanted to talk about press releases. I know we spoke about them briefly earlier. What makes a good press release for you guys? What makes a bad one? Does any stand out? I hate the ones you get that go like, greetings of the day, or hi, I hope you're having a great day. You know, exclamation yes. marks. Uh, I don't know why there's this weird thing with press releases. You know, there's these weird cliches that have come about. I just want the information in a nice structured yeah. way. Uh, the, the best press releases I get are the ones that say, hello, insert name here, here's a press release about X, uh, if, and it attach, attaches a document with a, a, a brief overview of what goes on, a couple quotes, and then uh, says, if you want any interviews, please let me know. And I'm like, right, okay, I'll just I'll, I'll grab the press release, write that up, and ignore your interview request. Um, <laughs> so, Do you mean, yeah. actually, they've left X in? They've, they've put... Oh, no, no, Dear no, no, Mr. Um, Journalist, because I've had that before. Do it in certain I've, <laughs> in certain I've had the wrong name before, but uh, that usually just means Dear Michael or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Which is, okay. I had an interesting one from the rug from England rugby the other day, which was like, uh, I had that as well. Uh, so I don't, I don't write about sports. But I didn't fair get enough. That. <laughs> so about women, England women's rugby team or something. Like okay. Uh, I I th no, I think I think it was uh, reporting the official travel provider or whatever. I was oh like, right. Okay. Oh okay. Yeah, it nice. was the official. The official travel provider for the England women's rugby team or something. Was that right? was oh it, God. yeah. <laughs> That's perfect for us. Anyway, it's, it's like, it's, yeah, you get you get press releases from, I mean, yeah, from everyone and anyone. The amount of times, Dom, you, you get these. You get, can I put article on website? What is it about? Oh, it's about <laughs> sports slot machines. No, you can't. It's strictly not related to anything we do. Shut do up and really leave me alone. They're going to ask a journalist, "Can I put? Can you do an article?" And the journalist will say <laughs> yes without asking what it is first. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I know. And then, what? I've I've had before where like a company's been like, "Here is my Dota two article," and I'm like, 
Sam's like, can you have a read over this? Because he doesn't do Dota. And I'm like, yeah, mate, this is absolutely 185% pure garbage. This is going nowhere near the website. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, you get some funny stuff through this. Um, but I mean, press releases for me, I personally just don't understand why you need to, like, not fabricate, but you, you don't need to add. It's like a waste of their time as much as it is our time. Mm. Like, saying. Okay, yes, on a few publications, it might sneak through that they're the leading organisation or the world's best, when they're just not. It's I, not true. I hate all that stuff uh, going right? through. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I'm uh, people know this. I'm open with it. I occasionally put some sponsored articles on Esports News UK. I think native content is a lot better, a lot valu- more valuable than like ads. No one really clicks on ads that much. Um, but I'll always mark it up. But the amount of sponsored articles I get that are full of like this is the greatest thing in the world and i have to take it out and say look you can't put that you know we can't be seen to be saying that because it's not true and it's just fluff you know but that probably gets through you know they they, and i feel for the press officers sometimes the prs because they know that that's not a great piece of writing but it'll be their bosses it'll be their clients that will say oh no we have to put this because it's part of our ethos it's part of our slogan yeah. we are the world's I mean, I think it's just, best yeah you know? it's just part of the it's just part of the like pr circle jerk roundabout kind of thing it's, it's just the way they do it. It, it it's fine right it's like equally they're like why do they take it out all the time but they i mean i've spoken to prs that write these things and they're like yeah i don't want to do it but you exactly. have to do it right yeah. if you sent a plain pr just describing your client as whatever they're going to go down the road to the next pr who's going to send out to all these media outlets that they're the world's best because that makes them feel better it massages their ego yeah um, so i understand as much from their side that they have to do it at the same time with me i'm like i wish they didn't because it makes my life slightly more inconvenient but it's not it's not that big an issue it's like a a minor like annoying point that's pretty much it yeah okay um all right mike anything you want to add around press i think on a on on a similar note it's not necessarily press releases um but especially on the larger scale not necessarily in the uk um teams if you're like a team owner just get someone or be prepared to do it yourself who can answer questions and will set up interviews so like there is a reason why every time Immortals does anything ever, every publication will have an interview with their CEO, their new player, they'll have the press. Right, That's exactly. because they've got they've got their own PR man. They have an internal person who works at Immortals, so whose good, sole man. job it is just to reach out to teams, reach out to, not teams, reach out to journalists' websites, to set up interviews with the teams. Mm. That's why if I get an editor to turn around to me and go, right, I want an interview with the League of Legends team and I need it within the next seven days, I'm going to go to one of about three teams that I know have a PR person that I can work with mm. and that can turn that around in seven days instead of going through about 10 different people to try and find the person I need to speak to. Mm. Make it obvious who that person is and make them make it easy for press to get access to, to the players, to the announcements, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. And that's how you get your coverage. It's not about necessarily... like Half the stuff that Immortals send press releases out, Like if, if I just saw that on Reddit, I'm not going to care. But because it says at the bottom, we can set up an interview with Noah Winston, with our new, our new COO, our new Counter-Strike players. Mm. As soon as it says that, I can go, right, okay, I know that's an easy win that yeah. I can set up within the next seven days and it's topical. Right, I'm going to write about it. And there's much more interest. Like, Optic, when they signed their Dota team, like, man, I'd, I'd quite like to have interviewed them, but fuck me, getting anything out of Optic unless you're going through a sponsor. It's like pulling nails to anything. Well, exactly. What? But- Hey. <laughs> what's this yeah. something's been shared in the chat right yeah, no, I just I just said you, it's not really topical but you'll read that when it's done oh I, I, I saw that yeah I, well I saw the rumour of it the other day yeah and, I, and that's come through thanks for sharing that I'll, I'll get on that oh wait well, that, that's two days old you probably read it already oh, I've probably already realize, read it yeah I was meaning to go back and, and change some article <laughs> but at this point there's so many rumours upon rumours I'm just waiting but yeah <laughs> I should do something um, that what you were saying Mike brings me nicely onto the nice uh, the last point around sort of competing with other people for news that aren't journalists. So, for example, you've got influencers, YouTubers. YouTubers are more entertainment-focused than, than news and informing, but um, orgs as well. You know, if I'm writing news, um, 
I'm technically in a way competing with the UK esports orgs that put their own announcements up. But what I've realised, you know, over the years doing this stuff, that news is news, and I'll often just retweet it now. And people don't understand sometimes. They'll come to me and go, Dom, can you write about this? If it's just a small roster announcement, then no, because there's a million UK orgs with a million roster announcements every week. I need something exclusive, something fresh, something different. If you want to get me the captain of that team to say something interesting about uh, the state of UK League of Legends or a bold ambition they've got, or you know maybe they're not on friendly terms with another team and th there's something going on there or something interesting then yes I'll do it um, what, what what are your guys thoughts on competing with in a way the people you're writing about because of how the nature of Twitter and competing with influencers yeah I, I mean I think I think it goes back to basically the cycle that I see is for, especially on the global scale with the likes of Dota. I mean, it's, it's weird, right? In Counter-Strike, you have James Decay from Slingshot, who everyone knows is the guy that will typically report roster shuffles before they they happen. Um, in, in Dota, post-TI, I knew, I knew most of the roster changes. I know about 10 people, 15 people, 20 people that knew the roster changes. There was a couple of, like, murmurs on Twitter. No one wrote it up in an article because at the same time as it was like, look, at the same time, just respect the players. Let them announce their rosters when they're ready. Why do you need to go out and leak it before it happens? Some people like it. Some people don't. I mean, it could have made a site a few clicks if you, like, drew a clickbaity, here's the new rosters for whatever. But at the same time, some people just have different attitudes towards whatever um yes i guess it is news personally i mean i don't i think i would go mad if i had to do a lot of actual like relevant new like sorry um like esports non-business driven news because like i said i just i just feel like most of it comes through player posts it on twitter if you didn't see it on twitter there and then then you'll see the tweet put on reddit yeah and it just goes around in a big circle especially on the global scale anyway um, which that's, I think would just drive me mad if I was just regurgitating blah 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 yeah. whatever. So that's why I do more analysis now. So for example, past few last week, uh, XL Esports, um, one of their co-founders, uh, Joel, has moved to Gfinity, and the other co-founder, Kieran, he's become a full-time MD at the org. Mm. I knew it was already old news because it was two days ago, but I wanted to write about it because I felt it was interesting. So I did the angle of an opinion piece hard work pays off here's what we can all learn from those guys you know and i just wrote my honest thoughts on it and that made it fresh you know and i think people like that analysis you know it's why they go on youtube for roundups you know news roundups and things like that so that's something a journalist can offer right that analysis i guess yeah, yeah. but i do think that it depends on the situation that you're in so where i differ from a lot of you guys is i'm not tied to a publication so obviously you've got esports news uk uk csgo and esports decider all of which do news um where you're gonna do your news when you're a freelancer and if i've got a news gig that is say just because it's the most common number that is five news posts a day hmm. um if one of them news posts can is again it depends what you're writing about if you're on an esports website that covers everything and you don't five news posts then you could probably find five things more interesting than a roster change yeah. but if you're doing Counter Strike only and you do five posts every day, then sometimes you do just have to go, yeah, right, that's a news story that's got a quote, a 200 word quote in. I need to write a 400 word news story. Well, that 200 word quote is half of it done. Um, and so I think it depends what your aim is. If it's like you guys, where you want to drive tra traffic to your site but also have quality content, then yes, I think what you guys, what you said there, Dom, is do it, do a different angle. Don't just regurgitate yeah. what's already out there put your own spin on it if you're a freelancer who is got to do five news stories a day as well as any other work you've got to do <laughs> five news stories a day is not enough to support yourself on financially then sometimes you have to go yeah a roster change it might not be the most interesting thing in the world but it's news it's there it's, it's something that people will click no, i mean I'm, i don't have anything against it being reported I, I fully i fully agree that it should and i think it would drive me mad if i did it personally but i understand why it is reported because it is news it's like you wouldn't see a bbc you wouldn't see a BBC or a football transfer not being reported. Of course it's going to be reported. It is big news. It's a change in personnel for a team. So it should, I fully admit that it should be reported. Mm. It's just the whole ecosystem. Whereas normally I, I kind of feel like you should have the content. It, it should be come through official means and then it should 
like in, in in an ideal world you have the content it goes up on a website and then that will then get shared on twitter and reddit whereas it's twitter to reddit to content it's kind of a flipped and inverse world at the moment which mm. is kind of annoying but it's it's yeah it's no i don't i don't begrudge anyone that writes news off reddit because yeah if you have to do that you have to do it that's where the news is that's that's where you get it from you don't go as per reddit sources you you, you write it straight from the straight from the horse's mouth or rather than quoting reddit kind of thing so yeah all right, cool. Guys, thanks so much for this chat. It's been really good. It's been about an hour and a half. We've got a hell of a lot in. Is there anything else you want to add? Any closing comments? No, I think we covered quite a lot. Yeah, no, I think we've just basically covered the entirety of esports journalism and nothing else ever needs to be said about it. And now we just all, all like, quit and never come back. Uh, we've no. given all our expertise that now like everyone's just going to come and take our jobs now. So we've kind of... <laughs> I just screwed it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks uh, so much, guys, for taking part. I'll yeah. put uh, your Twitter handles in uh, in the description when I put this video over to YouTube. Hopefully, it will help people in the future find out more about esports journalism. Not just people that want to get into it, but people that want to know what we do, how it works, you know, how to deal with us, that kind of thing. Um, uh, so, yeah. Uh, do check out all our sites uh, for Let's Know Esports News UK, UK CSGO, Esports Insider, and Mike Stubbs' stuff. Follow him on Twitter. At Mike Stubbs, everything. On Twitter, there, there we yeah. go. Uh, the best UK <laughs> esports, uh, the best esports journalists in the UK. And also, before we go, make sure you go and vote for Ollie because he's up for. No, don't vote for Ollie. <laughs> um, I can't, I don't can't vote. vote with him when he's got a massive ego. <laughs> I do not have. I do not have a Mike Stubbs ego. <laughs> I see. It. I was, the, the name eluded me. It's Esports Industry Awards uh, Journal of the Year, but you're up against the likes of Richard Lewis and Foreign, right, Ollie? So no, he's not going to win. Um, I'm not going to win. Who have a million I'm quiet, actually. <laughs> but I'm yeah, not so, saying anything. Yeah, Stubbs, Stubbs has voted for me. <laughs> no. No. I haven't voted. I haven't. Yeah, I need to. Cool. I need to get on it at some point. I'm just not going to vote. <laughs> All right, guys. Listen. Thanks so much. Um, it's been a pleasure. I'm, Cheers for having us, Tom. No, you're welcome. I, thanks for setting it up. It's been really good. It has been. It's been a while in the in the pipeline, but we got there. And I'm sure I'll bump into you guys at an event real soon. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Okay. Thanks for watching, guys. And uh, yep. See you soon. Cheerio. Bye.